yeah, today I'll be presenting on yeah the, the paper of the same name, Achieving SMO Without Honest Players. Uh, it's joint work between myself, Vanessa Daza, and Matteo Pontecorbi. Um, and yeah, so I guess the, the plan for today's talk will be um, just a bit of motivation behind why we're interested in SMO and why we're particularly interested uh, in SMO Without Honest Players. Uh, then, given that we're talking about SMO with honest players, we have, we're, we're going to introduce a game theoretic framework to then model players within the SMO systems. Um, within this new framework that we're proposing, uh, we will then, I will, I will then outline a tender stake, uh, which is a protocol which achieves SMO in this new framework. And then I will briefly discuss uh, some future work. Uh, okay, so I'll go straight into it. So state machine application, um, everyone, I know everyone has sort of mentioned it in their own words, but um, it just allows uh, a distributed set of players to agree on a sequence of values acting on a, a, a state machine so that all players in the system can, can uh, sh share the same view of the state machine. Um, and it becomes particularly interesting. So, so all these protocols depend on some honest players, or at least in it, when they're originally um, formulated. Uh, but they become particularly interesting when some of the players in the system um, are Byzantine. Um, but fast forward to today, um, these state machine application protocols, although they started off in theoretical computer science long before the internet, um, they actually formed the basis to uh, all the major cryptocurrencies that we know today. Um, so these players, these honest players who were originally just following the protocol um, for the sake of following the protocol are now actually providing a service for a much wider community and they're being paid for the service. Um, and I just want to highlight the fact that this service, the, the amount of money that's involved is, is 1.35 trillion as of today. Um, every, I've, I've read this, this slide a few times over the last week and I've had to mark it down every day, but uh, hopefully it's, it's stopping now. But uh, anyway, these honest by default players are now the receiving rewards for providing this SMO uh, for a much wider community. Um, so does it really make sense to uh, consider these players honest by default anymore? Um, so we're in this work, we're, we're considering um, in this presentation, I I'm sort of going to propose what can we actually do when these players are no longer honest and they're actually just trying to maximize the amount of money it's tokens that they're, uh, they're receiving in these protocols and can we achieve SMO in that, in the, in that scenario. Uh, so yeah, removing the altruistic dependency that currently uh, underpins all of the standards which, which, uh, which are our, our, our cryptocurrencies and uh, statement application protocols depend on. Um, so a little bit more motivation. Um, so this flashbots.net website, um, which is a direct result of Flashboys 2.0, it's just showing that um, on Ethereum, uh, as a, as a uh, sort of an example, as representative, I think, of, of other protocols, that the amount of money that the miners of, of Ethereum are making by acting selfishly is growing uh, almost exponentially. Um, so selfish behavior, basically, um, so sorry, just to sort of summarize what I've, what, what I've described so far. So we have this growing market cap. So We've gone from zero dollars to 1.35 trillion. So we started off with honest players, and now we're at this 1.35 trillion uh, um, market cap. Players are uh, provably and identifiably acting selfishly, and selfishness isn't. It doesn't look like it's going to stop getting more profitable. Uh, so why are we still depending on these honest players um, to secure our uh, SMR protocols? Um, yeah. So. Exactly, just reiterating why, uh, why are these standards that, that, that we're depending on um, based on honest players? Um, so to address this, um, we introduced a game theoretic framework um, called the buyer model. Um, so it's just removing the altruistic players, these honest by default players, and assuming players are either Byzantine, which is a standard uh, assumption in distributed systems, that deviate arbitrarily and are controlled by some uh, single adversary and rational players who seek to maximize some known uh, utility function, assuming all of the players are rational. Um, and then, so I guess some people might be aware of the bar model, which although it's popular and becoming more popular by the day, it still isn't the standard. People are still depending on honest players, uh, honest majorities to, to uh, secure uh, these SMR protocols. Uh, so the buyer model isn't totally new. Uh, it was originally discussed uh, in a paper called When Selfish Meets Evil. Um, but it was in the MPC setting. Um, and there is some key differences for SMR. So with, with MPC, there is one decision to be made, one payoff that's trying to be maximized. Whereas in SMR, there is possibly infinite rounds, possibly infinite decisions 
these, the, the decision tree grows exponentially uh, in SMR protocols um, as, as the rounds increase. Um, when we're considering SMR protocols, particularly SMR protocols where the rewards are directly proportional to your voting share, as in uh, or your, your control of the SMR protocol, as in uh, proof of stake systems, we need to consider your rewards, but also the distribution of rewards, because an early increase in rewards can actually result in an increased share uh, for proceeding rounds, which results in increased re rewards in those proceeding rounds. So there's a lot of things to consider. And also compared to this original paper, uh, we want to move towards this concept of strict maximization of utility. So we have rational players. Um, we want to make sure that no matter what everyone else does, or at least given the rational uh, anticipation of what everyone else will do, the protocol strategy will maximize their, uh, their payoff. Uh, whereas Byzantine Nash equilibrium uh, is satisfied with equality of uh, payoffs uh, and assumes all non-Byzantine players are acting rationally. Um, so, oh, sorry, sorry, acting honestly, which, which again, we, we can't depend on honest players in, a, in the buyer model. Um, so we, as we're talking about rational players, uh, we need to have utility function. So I've already mentioned that we're sort of in this, considering this proof of stake um, uh, sort of uh, idea. So the utility that we're going to be measuring or that we're going to attribute to rational players uh, is going to be just the, uh, the, share in the, the share in the system at some particular round or dash uh, times the total stake in the system at that, at that same round. Now, when a player is choosing their strategy, they're going to try and maximize their uh, expected utility because obviously people would like to maximize the utility, but that becomes that's, that's a little trickier than maximizing your expected utility. Uh, you're, you're trying to maximize your profits in some anticipation of what other players are going to do. Um, now, that anticipation uh, in our model is baked into this private info. Um, so I guess I think I see a question, but I, unless it's uh, urgent, uh, will I keep going? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll keep going. If you stop me if, if anything needs to be addressed, sorry. Um, so private info contains information like the, a player, so for a player I will contain their current uh, the current uh, view of the system of the system. Um, so in partial synchrony, this could be different for every player. Um, it will contain the messages they received. It will contain who might be the leader in the current round, who who are the validators, uh, and then also the strategy. So we separate the strategy a player takes uh, from the private info because in this framework, we're going to try and iterate over all strategies to ensure that the protocol strategy is actually the strategy which maximizes uh, a player's expected utility. Um, Okay, so then buyer SMR. So SMR, um, the two properties that we're trying to achieve are safety and liveness. Uh, so we're taking, so for achieving buyer SMR, we're assuming that we have an SMR protocol that achieves, uh, the, the, that satisfies these properties of safety and liveness uh, under an honest majority. And then in the buyer model, we require two things. Um, we require that rational players will always follow the recommended protocol strategy and that the adversary cannot increase their share of control in the system. So we have these um, standard um, adversarial bounds that uh, have been sort of, have existed as long as uh, uh, distributed consensus has existed. Um, but we only, in, we only, in, in, in uh, our framework, we're only interested, we're only going to set this adversarial share in the system once at the very start of the protocol. And then we're going to try and guarantee that the adversary can grow in the system while simultaneously ensuring the rational players follow the protocol strategy, AKA, that they're incentivized to follow the strategy. Um, okay, and then I guess with, the, with that in mind, we, or with that sort of um, definition of what buyer SMR is and what we want to achieve, uh, we decided that the best way to do, the best way to sort of build a template for, because I guess the whole concept here is to allow every, everyone to apply the, our work to uh, current SMR protocols. So we decided to create a checklist of properties that people could check uh, within SMR protocols to sort of see if S buyer SMR can be guaranteed. Um, um, so the first part, so there's two properties. The first property is strong incentive compatible and expectation, uh, which, the, which is, this is the informal definition that's formally defined in the paper of the same name. Um, so for any rational player, they will eventually strictly maximize their expected utility in every proceeding round. Um, so the eventually is important here. I guess uh, a naive first step from our perspective, and I guess maybe from your perspective too, is that it would be nice if a rational player could always maximize in every possible time step their, their utility. But that's a little bit unrealistic because partial synchrony and uh, possibly um, 
I don't, there's, there's, there's lots of possible strategies which, which can have immediate gains. So I guess I'll use a cinematic analogy. Um, so we have to, to just sort of explain why eventually is what we're looking for here. Um, so we have two players. Uh, we have these players on the left who are considering a strategy um, and we'll, 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 we'll graph their utility in red. And then we have this player who is deciding to just follow the protocol strategy. Um, so the players following the protocol strategy has this constant uh, positive reward over time, or this, con this constant increase in utility. Um, whereas these um, other players who are considering this new strategy, they have this immediate gain um, that, that, that's, that definitely dominates the, the protocol strategy over this uh, short time period. But if it, our protocol guarantees that if there is some strategy which outperforms the protocol strategy, um, it will always be caught and you will be either identified and punished or some mutual destruction will, will occur. Um, well, then that's good enough to, 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 to ensure that rational players will always follow the uh, protocol strategy. Uh, so yeah, even when these, even when, so obviously if we have, we have these um, players who are following the protocol, if we can prove to them that the protocol strategy will always dominate, uh, that's what we're looking for. And in fairness, so this is related to the second point of achieving buyer SMR. So we want to ensure that the adversary can't increase their share uh, above the original share, except with negative probability. Um, and I guess that's hopefully a little bit intuitive, or I guess maybe it's been a long time and there's been too many gifts since the uh, definition of buyer SMR. But the key result from the first part of our work is uh, for an SMR protocol, uh, it achieves buyer SMR if and only if the protocol is strong instead of compatible and expectation and fair. So it turns out the strong set of compatibility and fairness are actually quite easy to uh, disprove. So if you have if you in, a, in protocols where they don't uh, when they, where, where they where they um, are not strong set of compatible or fair, um, many of the main main uh, cryptocurrencies are, are quite easy to prove that they're not strong set of compatible or not fair. Um, proving that they both exist uh, is actually a little bit trickier, and it's the the purpose of the second part of the of the um, presentation. Um, and it acts as a template then for, for how you would go about doing that. Uh, but our, our main goal here was just to, get, to provide two things that were hopefully a little bit more intuitive that could be checked. And if they do exist, you can guarantee the output of the SMR protocol, even when players are only Byzantine or rational, which uh, we thought was pretty nice. Uh, okay, so then Tenderstake. So Tenderstake is um, uh, amendment to the Tendermint protocol. And it is the first protocol to achieve buyer SMR and partial synchrony. So it's the, so it's achieving buyer SMR. We're fairly sure that no other protocol comes close to achieving buyer SMR, um, that there is a, 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 a over dependency on honest players. And more than that, we're, we're, we're achieving this in partial synchrony where we have adversaries who can um, maliciously schedule messages. Um, and players might be at um, sort of the, the network might be partitioned at certain points. Um, but okay, I'll go, I'll go into that later, I guess. Um, so a key part of the, so fairness require, fairness is, is in place to guarantee that an adversary can't grow. But in our protocol and in, in our threat model, we're assuming that the adversary can grow um, if, if there is a strategy that allows them to grow. Um, so sort of to, to explain the slide, if a rational player, if it's right, if an adversary controls players P1 to PF, uh, which shares S1H to SF, uh, SFH uh, at some height H in the blockchain, um, their total adversarial share in the following at the following uh, block, uh, following this at the following value decided in the blockchain, uh, would be the sum of those players' shares. Uh, so, if there is strategies that allow you to grow, uh, the adversary can exploit them, and this is even in a, even in partial synchrony that we're that this threat model is existing. Um, so yeah, it's an important contribution, and I guess it's uh, a direct sort of a reply to the Flashbots and Flash Boys paper and many other papers like Bitcoin oligarchy uh, and, and, and papers like that, where centralization, uh, given that there is some minor extractable value or some um, uh, advanced research uh, teams or cheaper electricity, it, centralization is a massive concern for, for the SMR protocols that we know. So we have to consider an adversary who, who could possibly grow. And how can we handle that adversary? And can we achieve buyer SMR in that setting? Um, so here's a, an overview of the, uh, the, the tender stake, stake machine. Stake machine. Um, 
For people who are familiar with tendermint, uh, it's quite similar apart from two states, um, the identified deviator state and the uh, slashing state. Um, so the identified deviators just requires that um, players will, if they observe a player in the system as deviating, um, deviating uh, in our paper is, I have not a non-exhaustive list here, but things like sending duplicate messages, uh, sending invalid proof of transition, which I will explain in the next slide, um, or sending non-protocol messages signed by the player. So anything that is signed by a player which isn't uh, uh, allowed within the system is a deviation. Uh, and we require players to identify deviators and then in the slashing condition, in the slashing state to any identified deviators to uh, destroy their stake. Um, and then in the encoding of the uh, tender stake protocol, we have two key differences. So people who are familiar with tendermint, um, I guess, the two, the two key differences we have are proof of transitions. So in the previous slide, we can see that to move from the uh, proposed state to the pre-vote state, you're required that the, to receive a proposal message from, from, a, from a player. Uh, so with, if, you don't, if you don't provide a proposal message when you try and send a pre-vote message, uh, so if you don't attach the proposal message or the proof that you've gotten there, uh, that's, a, that's, that's considered a deviation in our protocol. Uh, and the proof of transitions are key to ensuring that rational players don't jump around the protocol and try and possibly uh, decide on values too quickly because as the decisions are, uh, as the rewards are paid out when decisions are made, it's possible that rational players might try and speed up decisions by potentially skipping steps. So that's something that we just, we, we put in there to handle that. And then the key part for incentivization is reward mechanism, which isn't defined in the tenderman protocol, but some, some um, reward mechanisms have been described, uh, but none of them come close to uh, Strong standard compatibility and expectations, but I will describe uh, the key parts of the reward mechanism here. Uh, so full loss of stake for deviators uh, for deviations. So that's a pretty standard. If I guess not pretty standard, but it's definitely been considered in other papers. Uh, but what we what we introduce here is a constant pair decision reward. So uh, which is proportional to your starting share. Uh, so there is so a lot of legacy reward mechanisms will, if you remove some other player from the system your share increases and your reward will then increase for proceeding rounds. So there is a potentially infinite increase in your rewards over, over, these, over uh, sufficiently many uh, rounds. Uh, so we want to handle that. So when we, when we remove, remove someone from the system, we, we proportionally re reduce the reward in, in the protocol. And we also introduce a bounded uh, positive commutative slashing reward. So players in the system, rational players in the system are incentivized to identify deviations when they happen but because it's bounded, it doesn't compete with the uh, full loss of stake of deviate for deviation if you were to potentially uh, try and slash someone who wasn't actually deviating. Um, so with that, with, with these three sort of very high overview uh, concepts, we then, that basically gives a strong set of compatibility and expectation that rational players are incentivized to decide on values, to not deviate and to identify deviations, or to identify deviations and thus not deviate. Um, so plugging in our the tender stake protocol into the previous the theorem from the first part of the paper, we achieve a uh, buyer SMR. We guarantee yes, buyer SMR if we have strong standard compatible and expectation and fair. So I've given an intuition about strong standard compatible and expectation. And for fairness, well, consider any any other strategy for an adversary in the system. That would involve sending a non-protocol message or a message that wasn't valid. Um, and because all rational players are following the protocol, they will identify that, that adversary and, just, and, and slash the, the, if they control P1 to PF, they'll, control, they'll slash whichever player was identified as send that message. So the adversarial share is bounded by the starting share, uh, which is exactly what fairness is. Uh, so by proving these two properties, we are able to guarantee the tender stake achieved by our SMR, which uh, yeah, hopefully will act as a template for a, uh, other people to, I guess, look at current existing uh, reward mechanisms and apply it, the, well, our, our techniques to that to the current protocols. So here's an, again just a, a sorry one second. Um, so here is a comparison of tender stake versus other protocols which have used the word incentive compatible or uh, fairness um, or talking about the bar model. Um, so. The evolving stake adversary. I've already described why that's very important, and uh, especially when you consider centralization of uh, protocols, which is a, is, a, is a very big concern at the moment. Um, but also the player models. So you'll see fruit chains, Snow White, Casper, and Bear Ledger. So um, 
these 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 um these protocols under the hood depend on some honest player or honest majority, uh, which as these as these protocols are growing, as as the uh, rewards get bigger for uh, acting rationally, we can't assume the players will act honestly anymore uh, by default. Um, and then the other the ones who remove honest players from the protocols, you'll see that the best network model they consider is, is synchrony. Um, and the best of these three protocols in terms of uh, approaching strong standard compatibility and expectation, in our opinion, is the second one, blockchains without waste. Uh, it's a paper by Sally. Um, and they do some really nice work on strong standard, or, or uh, that all the author does some really nice work on strong standard compatibility. Um, but the rewards are paid out uh, to one to one leader every round, which doesn't allow for fairness. And especially when it's uh, in partial synchrony, it's po possible for an adversary to uh, to manipulate the leader election and uh, increase the rewards in the initial round and then increase rewards for, for, for all preceding rounds. Um, so then future work. So I've given, um, so I've explained why we're, we're using evolving stake adversary, uh, but it requires us to use a, a, par, um, a static adversary. So we had a lot of goals in the paper. Uh, we're suggesting a new framework uh, for, for player modeling. Uh, so we had to draw the line somewhere. Uh, considering adversary, um, it was dynamic. Um, basically, you run into a problem where you have to, especially in partially synchrony, what is the adversarial stake and how do, if they send bad messages in the past, how do you handle that message, those messages when they switch players? Because our protocol depends on identifying uh, bad messages or deviations. So clearing buffers and all that sort of stuff seemed even more unrealistic than uh, just considering a static adversary for a first step. But it's that considering how, how we consider a dynamic adversary and can it be done is definitely some really something that we're really interested in doing. Uh, I've sort of already alluded a few times, we want to play our techniques of the protocols. We've tried to make it as easy to understand as possible. Um, so hopefully other uh, protocols can start to apply our techniques to achieve, to start moving towards by our SMR. Um, and, and only considering uh, trying to prove the security in a game theoretic sense. Um, and then the last thing we're interested in. So in our protocol in tender stick, we are only considering values without semantic uh, or with uh, the, the values and the ordering of the values are not of any value to the uh, players in the system. We know that Ethereum and, uh, and a lot of the protocols, the, the, the ordering of uh, the ordering of uh, Transactions can actually be very, very important and profitable for some players. Going back and adding that sort of semantics to, to our protocol and seeing what can we achieve, can we achieve any sort of uh, honesty or uh, security for the for the client side? Uh, it's going to be something really interesting. And if we can, given our framework for handling uh, everything else from a validator's perspective, uh, that would be a real that that would be basically, I think, the the line of the sand of guaranteeing that all um, current buyer SMR protocols would then be able to uh, guarantee that the output of the system would be provably secure and, and uh, in the client's interest. Um, okay, so I know that historically I've been a bit fast, but I hope, I hope everyone's understood the protocol. Here's my contact details. Um, and yeah, I hope there's any other questions, I'm happy to answer.